so a couple questions from Jessica Azron as well, a number of questions from Jessica Azron as well as Mary Jo Keen that uh, touch on a lot of timely topics. So this will actually uh, cover a lot. Uh, but if, if something else you have a question about, like I said, be sure you use the chat function to, to fire away. So one question is, um, is there any way you can calculate your chances of getting COVID in the area you're in before you get vaccinated? And what are your chances uh, of getting vaccinated uh, based on uh, what's going on in your, your area? So one thing I would emphasize is these vaccines do not prevent you from getting infected with COVID. What the vaccines do, they keep you getting big time sick if you get COVID. So uh, that's an important distinction to keep in mind. So even though you have good immunity to COVID-19 uh, after you've been completely vaccinated, it certainly is still possible you could acquire the infection and spread it. So. Uh, by no means do I want people to assume that they can't be vectors for spreading infection just because they've gotten vaccinated. The main advantage to the vaccine is, and all we really know from the trials, is that uh, it will keep you from getting significantly ill with COVID if you get infected. So your chances of getting infected are obviously greater if you're in, in an endemic area, but really the number one thing that probably determines your risk of getting infected is where you go in whatever area you're in if you are not protected and people are not protecting you. So the, the, the prevalence of COVID in any given community, it might be one in a thousand, but your risk of getting COVID might be higher there than if you went into an area where it's one in a hundred. If you go into an indoor venue where people are not wearing masks, so, you know, the main, the, the main circumstance where people are getting infected is in indoor venues when they're around unmasked people who unknowingly are carrying the virus. So that's the best way I can give you some risk assessment. Um, another question has been about the vaccine. Um, if you get vaccinated with one of the doses, of the two doses that are, uh, comprise the immunization with the Moderna vaccine as well as the Pfizer vaccine, what's gonna happen if you don't get the second dose and what's your percentage of protection? Uh, don't really know what the percentage of protection is. You will be protected after the first dose, usually within a couple of weeks of getting the vaccine, uh, people can have measurable antibodies. So there is gonna be some protection. It's just if you get that second dose at three weeks with Pfizer or four weeks with Moderna, your protection will be much, much greater than, is, than it would be if you only got the first dose of the vaccine. Um, so there's probably some wiggle room in terms of how effective that second booster dose is gonna be for you. Uh, you know, If you get it four to five weeks later instead of three weeks, three weeks after the initial Pfizer vaccine, more likely than not, you'll still get a good uh, significant boost to get full immunity once you get that second dose. The reason we know that one dose can be effective is that uh, they, they, when they looked at some of the uh, uh, data in these two studies, that they could see a protective effect even before people got the second dose. So in the cohort that was getting the real vaccine, uh, whether Moderna or Pfizer, uh, if you looked at the numbers of infections that people had at two to three weeks, it was already less in, in the treatment arm than it was in the, the, the patients that just got the placebo vaccine. So you do get some protection after the first vaccine. You will just get a lot more protection that will likely last a lot longer if you get the second dose. Uh, I mean, what we're seeing in, you know, in, in our practices is people have actually gotten infected twice with the virus this last year. And the immunity seems to go away probably after three to four months. Now, that's after you have a natural infection with the virus. Uh, whether the vaccine will give you immunity longer than that after uh, the, uh, if, longer with the vaccine than it would be if you got the actual infection, don't know the answer to that yet. It's just, it's too early to tell because these studies are, are actually still ongoing. So. 
Uh, we'll have more answers to that probably over the next four to six months. Again, your likelihood of getting COVID in any area if you're vaccinated um, is gonna be the same in terms of acquiring the infection. It's just that you're much less likely to get sick with COVID if you've gotten the vaccine. Uh, so I think that addresses some of the questions about the role of vaccine protection and whether you get COVID or not. I mean, as again, just remember, the vaccine doesn't keep you from acquiring the virus. You can have an asymptomatic infection uh, even though you've been vaccinated. There's no, we don't know at this point if vaccinated people uh, are completely free of the ability to transmit and shed the virus. That's an unanswered question. Uh, why did some people in the vaccine study still get COVID? Um, the answer to that is no vaccine is 100% effective. Uh, it may be that they got a large dose of the virus for whatever circumstance they were in before there were sufficient protective antibodies to keep them from getting sick would be the best, most likely answer to that question. Um, should the level of vaccine protection be the same in patients with a compromised immune system, such as lupus or Sjogren's? Um, yeah, the vaccine should work equally well in patients with autoimmune disease. There's no evidence that patients with autoimmune disease don't respond well to vaccines. Uh, there's two caveats to that. Uh, some of our patients with autoimmune disease have that in the setting of underlying immune deficiency. Uh, this is more common in Caucasian patients, but uh, if you have an underlying immune deficiency where you don't make good antibodies to vaccines such as Pneumovax, more likely than not, you probably won't make a good antibody to the COVID virus if you get the immunization. We still recommend that such patients get the vaccine. And the reason for that is vaccines not only stimulate the ability of your immune system to make antibodies, but they also uh, stimulate your immune system's T cells, the other component of the immune system that responds to acquired infections that don't make antibodies, but they're still important in fighting off viruses. The vaccine may still do that in patients that have what we call humoral immune deficiency where they don't make good antibodies. So uh, for that reason, we're still recommending that even some of our patients with autoimmune disease in the setting of underlying immune deficiency, they still should get the vaccine. It's not gonna hurt them and it may offer some benefit. The other issue has to do with treatments that patients with uh, rheumatic diseases, including lupus may be taking that could potentially impact the response to the vaccine. The, the ones that are of most concern in that regard are uh, the B cell depleting antibodies like rituximab or Gaziva. These are antibodies that uh, are given uh, still off label for patients having significant lupus complications that aren't responding to other therapies. So if you have depleted B cells, uh, the likelihood of you getting a good response to the vaccine isn't gonna be very good, particularly if you've had the rituximab in the last three to four months. So as you, those of you who may have been dosed with that for whatever reason, you know the dosing is, once you get that, you usually repeat that as needed every six months. So what we're recommending is that if you, if rituximab or a B cell depleting antibody is part of your treatment, that we, that you, wait at least three to four months since your last rituximab before you try to get vaccinated. Otherwise, it's probably not gonna work very well, if at all. On the flip side, if you're planning to get another dose of rituximab soon, it might be good to defer that until you've gotten two doses of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. Those are the two ones that are available right now. So that's one important thing to try to keep in mind, those of you who, who get B-cell depletion with rituximab. A lot of you are probably taking methotrexate. Um, we know from other immunizations that methotrexate can significantly inhibit the response to an immunization. So um, if, if you're on methotrexate, what I'm suggesting is that you try holding the methotrexate around the time you're getting the immunization. So if you're getting the Pfizer vaccine, 
or the Moderna vaccine, hold the methotrexate the week before you're scheduled to go get the immunization. And if you can, try not to re resume taking the methotrexate until a week after you get the second dose. Um, if things start flaring up with your joints or your skin where you can't do that, uh, maybe try to tide it over with a little bit of prednisone, but if at all possible, try to hold off on dosing the methotrexate until a week after the second dose of the vaccine and you'll probably have a better response. Um, let me just address some of the chat questions before we go on. Uh, whoops, there we are. Okay. Um, Yeah, so the question is whether, you know, where having lupus puts you into the hierarchy of whether you should, you know, move up in terms of getting vaccinated. So um, as it turns out, lupus isn't really turning out to be a risk factor for getting severe COVID. Um, we've heard they said lupus patients that have gotten the virus where it's triggered flares, but it, unless lupus patients have the other risk factors that we know are clearly associated with severe COVID, comp COVID complications, i.e. a BMI, obesity, a BMI greater than 35, if you have diabetes, if you have chronic kidney disease, um, those would put you at, at somewhat higher risk than just having lupus. So lupus by itself, unless you've got those other, what we call comorbidities, doesn't really put you at higher risk for COVID complications. Um, if you're on immune suppressants, um, that can potentially increase your risk. So that would put you into the group of patients where uh, they're trying to prioritize, you know, people over the age of 65, people on immunosuppressants or that have some of those other uh, comorbidities. While I am on that topic, um, patients that have any of those uh, comorbidities that put them in the higher risk group that are being prioritized for vaccination, if any of those patients do get infected with the virus, it's recommended that we try to get them access to the uh, monoclonal antibodies that can be given as a single dose, either re the Regeneron antibody or the Lilly antibody, uh, as that may decrease the likelihood of you having a, a severe course. So, um, but having lupus alone without those, those comorbidities of being on a strong immune suppressant, and I would not put Plaquenil in that group. Plaquenil really isn't an immune suppressant, it's more of an immune modulating drug. But if you're on high doses of steroids or you're taking mycophenolate or azathioprine, uh, or you've been on, if you've been getting rituximab, uh, this would put you in that higher risk group to be considered for either a monoclonal antibody therapy if you get infected or uh, you know, being on a higher level of prioritization for getting the vaccine. Is there vaccine efficiency difference in minorities? Insofar as we know, no. Uh, I think people of different racial ethnic backgrounds usually respond equally well to vaccines. Uh, if you've had some of the uh, treatments for lymphoma, which can incorporate rituximab, yeah, that would put you in a high-risk group uh, if you've had that therapy recently. Uh, and you would also be, you should be considered for getting monoclonal antibody therapy if you happen to get infected. Um, as far as timing the vaccine, uh, in terms of when you get your therapy, that's a discussion you would need to have with your oncologist. But um, if your cancer is still in an active phase and you're going through an induction treatment, it's probably best to not let that get off schedule and then just try to get the vaccine at a, what we call a trough time uh, when you're at the end of the cycle before you're going to get dosed again with rituximab would be the best time to get the vaccine. And so far as we know, other immune modulating drugs such as Actemra or um, TNF inhibitors, Insofar as we know, those don't affect vaccine responses. Um, so at this point, I wouldn't say I would advocate people coming off those around the time they get vaccinated. Uh, Benlista, we know, does not appear to affect vaccine responses. So there's really no reason that you need to um, dance around the dosing of the 
Ben Lista. We talked about Clacknail should not affect uh, vaccine responses. Okay, um, I'll move on to some other questions. Um, so people want to know, am I hesitant to receive either of these vaccines? So the answer is no. I just got the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine yesterday. Um, I was a little bit leery today because everybody was saying that they how achy they felt the day after they got their second dose. I haven't had any aches and pains today, so I don't know. Maybe I'm just lucky or just don't get those responses. But I, I just got a very sore arm and shoulder right now, probably more sore than it was after the first shot. But um, I've tolerated it pretty well. I don't have any hesitancy about either of those vaccines for anybody. Um, I'm, we're recommending that all of our patients in rheumatology clinic, where they have lupus or anything else, that they get take, to take the first vaccine that they can get access to. Um, and I'm not hesitant about either of those. The ones that are currently available, the AstraZeneca vaccine will probably be the one that comes out next. Um, that's not an mRNA vaccine like the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are. It's more of a traditional va vaccine construct. Um, you know, I, I mean, that's basically like getting the flu shot. So it's, it's, it's still, it's, it's the same type of technology and, and immunization method uh, is employed with how that vaccine is put together. Um, People have a question about if these vaccines are alive. The only one that's, I mean, certainly none of them are alive coronavirus vaccines. The, the only live vector is the adenovirus vaccine that one companies make where they give you an attenuated live adenovirus that uh, carries the material for the, the vaccine. Um, even in patients that are uh, mildly immune suppressed, that's usually not going to be an issue. It's just those vaccines probably are just best avoided in patients that have just undergone really high intense cancer chemotherapy or a bone marrow transplant. But the, the other vaccines other than the adenovirus vector vaccine are, are pretty much fine for everybody. Um, a few questions about how this is uh, spreading in the community. Um, I mean, really what we're observing is most people, and most people I took care of last week with the residents that I was working with, they got their vaccine in a household or going to a venue where people were indoors without a mask, whether it was family members or non-family members. So um, if there are family members that are out and about where they are exposed to other people who may be carrying the virus asymptomatically and are not strictly adhering to masking rules, you know, they can bring that into the household and infect everybody. Um, you know, I hear that story repeatedly all the time. That's probably the most common way the majority of patients that we see get infected have gotten infected. So um, in my household, I have two teenage girls, one's in college getting ready to leave Friday, one's in high school. Uh, we all wear masks inside the house because I don't trust them. I don't trust them. So when I ride in the car with them, they put on a mask and I'm wearing a mask. So uh, just kids have a very hard time consistently adhering the recommendations. And so if they're with their peers doing anything, um, you know, the likelihood of transmission is there and they can bring that into any venue where they, they go, where people, where they're not masked and other people are not masked either. So that really is, I think, the most common way people are getting infected. That's why you see these big surges after the holidays because big family groups gather and it all just takes one. It just takes one to infect the whole household or the whole group. And if you saw the pictures from the campus of uh, University of Alabama last night, I'm imagining there's gonna be a little bit of a surge in, in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, yeah. if you've got a student in college in Tuscaloosa, uh, I would arrange for them not to come home for at least the next two weeks. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so that answers, I think, most of the questions that were pre-submitted. Um, we'll just open this up for other questions, and uh, I'll go through some of the things in the chat that have come on since we last visited that. Questions about the new variant people are hearing about. You know, there's always going to be var new variants of the virus. Um, there's probably variants out there now we don't know about. But um, what this 
what it really requires to stay on top of this are lots of sequencing, <laughs> sequencing of the virus in communities. Some of the European countries are doing a better job of that than we are here in the US right now in terms of the intensity of effort they're putting into that. But hopefully that'll uh, pick up here as well to try to stay on top of what new variants in the virus may be out there. So the one variant that's known the most about that's been in the press the most lately has been the one that's just appears to be associated with greater infectivity. If the virus is not any more severe, it's just more easily, appears to be more easily transmitted. Um, so, you know, what governs viral transmission has to do with how well the virus can adhere to your airway once you inhale it, as well as um, how rapidly it uh, replicates. Both of those things could be associated with increased viral uh, transmission. Uh, some questions about vaccine side effects. Um, really, really the most side effects that have been described are just you know local soreness at the, in the muscle where it's injected and some aches and pains that can occur a day or two afterwards. Thus far, I haven't really heard of any lupus patients getting flares of their disease after they get vaccinated. Um, certainly we see flares that have occurred in the setting of getting infected with the virus. So I think your risk of getting a flare in the setting of all this is much greater if you get infected with the virus than it is if you get the vaccine. Um, good question you might ask as well, does getting the vaccine prevent me from getting a flare if I get infected with the virus, even if I don't get sick with the virus? Um, my answer to that is probably if you've been vaccinated, the virus is gonna be less likely to triggering a significant lupus flare. Um, because usually significant lupus flares are gonna occur in fairly symptomatic virus infections. So usually we see this most commonly in people that get sick with influenza, they get the flu, they're very symptomatic with it. And then, you know, several days following the onset of that illness, then they start to develop signs of a significant lupus flare. So uh, I can't 100% scientifically answer the question as to whether if you're a silent carrier, if that increases the risk of you getting a lupus flare or not. But my, my hunch would be that if you've gotten vaccinated, the likelihood of the virus triggering a lupus flare in you is gonna be a lot lower because the virus isn't gonna make you sick. Uh, is the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine also safe for lupus patients? Well, you know, we don't know if the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are completely safe for lupus patients. And we don't know if the AstraZeneca that vaccine is gonna be safe for lupus patients. I don't have any reason to think that it's not. Uh, so far, we haven't seen reports yet of lupus patients having any issues getting either, vaccine, either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. And, um, you know, I'm sure there are probably some lupus patients that were included in those trials. I don't know if it was 100% an exclusion. I don't think it was. I have to go back and look. But uh, you know, lupus patients get vaccinated all the time at our encouragement because we don't want them getting a virus like flu, which can sometimes trigger a really nasty, sometimes potentially fatal lupus flare. So uh, again, I, I think there's a lot more upsides to getting vaccinated to this virus than any downsides in the context of lupus. Uh, if we hear of anything, we will start disseminating this information on this side and others. But at this point, there's no reason for me to tell you that you need to be more concerned about this vaccine just because you have lupus. Uh, another question about spread. What do you do about eating with family members in the home? Um, you know, if those family members are quarantined in your house and don't go out and about without a mask, then you can eat with them unmasked in the home. But if they're out and about doing stuff, being exposed to people not wearing masks and not wearing masks themselves, then I would be a little leery about uh, having that person sit down at the dinner table with you. Um, so that's, that's just the reality of it. Uh, you just have to be very careful about importing the virus into 
households. And around the dinner table, it can certainly be a way to transmit the virus. If people aren't adhering to what they're supposed to be doing. Now, if you 100% trust those people that are in your household when they're out and about, um, then that's fine. You can enjoy dinner together, maybe keeping six feet apart. <laughs> but, uh, it's, you just, you just have to follow the rules. I mean, the rules are very simple, but you know, the majority of the population, unfortunately, is not following the rules. And that's why we're in this mess we're in in the United States, just to be frank. Okay, working from home. Um, leery about going out into the city, wherever you are, whether it's Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Nashville, Chattanooga, wherever. Um, you know, I think um, you're safer working at home, obviously, uh, because your, your exposure to other people is going to be limited. Um, you know, it's fine to go about out and about in the city. You can go run errands. Just, you know, the likelihood of you picking up this virus walking around outside anywhere, unless you're in a really crowded group of people who are not wearing masks outside, uh, you're probably going to be fine. You just you got to be careful about walking into an indoor venue where people are not masked. So, you know, my rule and what I tell patients is if you walk into a building and there's a bunch of people in there not wearing masks, you best exit. Okay, zinc. Um, you know, zinc lozenges for years we've known can decrease the duration and severity of common colds, um, which by and large are coronaviruses, just not this bad one. Um, COVID-19 probably would behave equally in that regard. So if, if you come down with early respiratory symptoms uh, as though you're getting a cold, what we recommend, what I recommend is that you just go, you get some zinc lodges and start sucking on those just as you would if you were coming down with a common cold. Um, will that prevent you from getting big time sick from COVID-19? I can't promise you and tell you that, uh, but just we do know that zinc lozenges, when you start using those, um, not zinc oral supplements that you swallow, that's not gonna do anything. But the lozenges that you suck on where you're bathing the lining of your throat with the zinc uh, will decrease the replication of coronaviruses. And it may, you know, mollify the severity of the infection that, that you have should you get, should the cold syndrome you're having be the initial symptoms of COVID-19. So uh, the zinc lozenges are not going to hurt you and they may help. Uh, but it's, it's the lozenges you want to use, not the oral supplements that you just swallow. So whether the vaccine going forward, is it going to be used annually like the general flu shot? Um, I would suspect it probably is. Um, I think uh, at least for the next three to four to five years, I think that's a high likelihood. Whether it can be mixed in with the regular flu shot, uh, I don't know yet. Um, a lot of it depends upon how sustainable the immunity is to the vaccine. So if it gets you through the entire six month flu season, uh, like we hope flu virus vaccines do, that would be great. The problem is this is not just a seasonal virus. I mean, you know, there were big time surges in the summertime. So uh, it may be that you have to get this vaccine every six months, we just don't know yet. We'll have to see what the sustained, uh, at least measurable antibody levels are emanating from these trials once we're that far into them. So, you know, most of these trials just finished six months in early to mid fall. So, you know, we won't know how long these patients are still having protection um, until people are measuring the antibodies in the patients that actually got the actual vaccine going out eight, nine, 10, 12 months. Then we'll have a better idea, perhaps, of how often people have to get immunized. Um, just from what I've seen in my own daughter, as well as other patients that have gotten infected, 
uh, again, I think the immunity from a natural COVID infection may actually be shot after about three to four months. So um, hopefully the vaccine will give us a little bit more sustained immunity, but we just have to wait and see. If all the family members have been vaccinated, do we still need to wear masks, uh, whether it's in the house or going to school or work? The answer is yes, because as I said, um, you can still transmit the virus even though you've been vaccinated. And even though the vaccine will keep you from getting sick, we don't know that at, at this point, if it'll prevent you from acquiring and transmitting the virus. So until we know otherwise, we're still gonna be wearing masks, at least for the next six Six months. If other vaccines cause flares, are you likely to flare from this vaccine? Um, it's a good question. Um, most people flare from vaccines due to the adjuvants in the vaccine. Adjuvants are things that rev up your immune system to respond to the microbial proteins that are in the vaccine. So um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines don't use classical adjuvants in that regard because of the way they work. Um, so I, I can't tell you for sure if, if you're not gonna have a severe flare when you get one of those vaccines. Um, you might, but there's a good reason to think that you might not too. So, um, but everybody's experience is different and you know, flares and reactions to vaccines are highly individualized. But I would not assume just because you've had flares after you've gotten other traditional vaccines that it means you're going to flare after the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, um, just because they're different. Um, now, with the AstraZeneca vaccine, that's a little bit more similar to traditional vaccines, so that might be one that you would have trouble with. Okay, a little bit of a question about the difference between immunosuppressants and immunomodulating medications. So um, the um, immunosuppressants are drugs that decrease the ability of your immune system to respond to an infection. Um, anything that does that, we would consider an immune suppressant. So that's steroids, azathioprine, mycophenolate, Calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin or tacrolimus, uh, cytoxin. You know, risk we talk with patients about before they start those therapies include a discussion about the suppressing your immune system. Uh, medications I would consider not immune suppressant in the classical sense, but more just modulating your immune system. So it sort of puts a damper on the overactive immune responses that are part of lupus, since this is a lupus population, we'll talk about it in that context. Uh, Anti-malarials, they don't really suppress your immune system, they're immune modulating drugs. Benlista, doesn't really suppress your immune system, it's more of an immune modulating drug. Um, Dapsone, not an immune suppressant, more of an immune modulating drug. Um, can't think of any other examples. Um, if somebody's on something I haven't mentioned, put it in the chat box and, and I'll comment on it. Uh, but that's kind of the distinction that we make. The difference between our mRNA vaccine and AstraZeneca. So the, the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines, they work by uh, packaging a piece of the COVID-19 genome, and it's an RNA virus, so it's a piece of RNA, into these little uh, microcapsules that are taken up by cells in your body when it's injected in your muscle. And that RNA gets into the cells machinery for making proteins and instructs the cells to make that component of the virus which then gets released by the cell to where your immune system can recognize it. And that's how the RNA vaccine works. The advantage is you can make a ton of vaccine very quickly because you've got the code to make the protein. And the factory for doing that is in the person's body, not in a laboratory, okay? So the reason that these vaccines got out the quickest 
in highest number is because they, you can make them incredibly efficiently. Um, and fortunately, they seem to work, which is the good news. The AstraZeneca vaccine is more of a traditional vaccine where you manufactured uh, in the lab the protein that your immune system is responding to, and then you're injecting that into the patient, which is kind of the traditional ways that we have immunized in the past. So these Pfizer Moderna vaccines, these are the first mRNA vaccines that have ever been used in humans. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of questions about, you know, what unusual side effects can we expect? And so far, at least six months experiences, they're not seen a lot and may be better tolerated than traditional vaccines for the reasons I alluded to earlier. But we'll just wait and see, because you don't know what's gonna happen in terms of side effects until something gets out into a very larger population. You know, most side effects of drugs that are approved don't become apparent until post-marketing pharmacovigilance studies are done. And then, then you find out what some of the rare side effects can be. So, I mean, some of those may turn up with these vaccines, so hopefully not, but you know, it's just too early to tell. Hey, Dr. Chatham, I'm giving you your two minute warning for your uh, 6.40 yeah, departure. That, that, I just got notified that that got canceled, so. Oh, good. okay, well, all right. Yeah, I got, I should, yeah. Um, should we be concerned about getting the vaccine if we got the flu shot in the fall? No, you should get the flu shot because we don't want you getting influenza because we know influenza can trigger severe lupus flares in some patients. I just wouldn't get them at the same time. So if, you've, if you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, now is the time to get it. If you've already gotten it, great. It's not gonna impact your response to the COVID vaccine or have any impact on that at all. Uh, I guess the question about from Tracy, what about getting it twice? You're talking about getting the virus twice? Yes. Yeah. So that certainly happens. I mean, I, I've had a couple of patients who have had it twice in 2019, um, about five to six months apart. Patient got it in April and got it again in November. So, um, so yeah, the immunity to this can be short lived if the immunity is triggered by having the endogenous virus. So um, uh, now you might ask the question, well, how do we know getting the vaccine isn't gonna have the same wear off effect. Um, you don't know that, but the hope is that the way the vaccine's administered, particularly getting the booster dose as has been vetted scientifically, uh, we think and hope that the immunity will be longer lasting. And this is the reason why there's a lot of trepidation about just giving more people one dose of the vaccine and not giving people the second dose of the vaccine. Um, I think there's, with an mRNA vaccine, they can manufacture so much of this. Uh, I don't see any reason why people shouldn't be getting the second dose of the vaccine. So I think what you're hearing about in the news is whether second dose of vaccines being held in stores for patients who have gotten the first dose uh, should just sit there uh, until that second dose is given. People are arguing that, well, why don't you go and roll that out on the assumption is by the time the second dose is due, that supply will have been resupplied. So um, with the RNA vaccines, that should be doable, but you know, we haven't, don't have the greatest track record of getting this vaccine out at this point. Hopefully that'll change in the coming weeks. A uh, question about Cosentix, um, that would be considered an immune suppressant. Um, you, whether that would affect vaccine responses, probably not, probably not. But if you're on Cosentix, that would put you in the immunosuppressed group where if you get infected, you should think about getting a monoclonal antibody and uh, it, it should put you in a priority tier for getting access to the vaccine. Okay, somebody a large rash on her injection arm after the first dose. Um, will she have the same reaction with the second dose? Um, maybe yes, maybe no. What I would suggest in that situation is just to pre-medicate with some Benadryl 
before you get the second dose, which is usually what we do when people have those kinds of local reactions. Wondering about um, if everybody in our household is already vaccinated past the two weeks post second dose of Moderna vaccine, then at that point, uh, if people are go, if, if some of us are going out into you know doing things outside of the house um, that may be exposing us, then when we come back into the house with all of us in our little pod being yeah. vaccinated, can we at that point take our masks off and eat together and do things because we're all vaccinated? Yeah, I mean, you're just, you know, again, the vaccine is just going to keep you from getting sick, okay? It's just, uh, it's not going to keep you from potentially transmitting the virus. So um, that's, so if you, if everybody's going out and about, or if they get exposed, they could bring the virus into the house and, the, and it could, you know, pass it around. Just none of you will likely get symptomatically sick from it. Or if you do get sick, it would be a very much milder illness. Now, again, the, you know, the, the vac, what we know this vaccine does, and the only thing we know this vaccine does, is help prevent people from getting seriously ill if they get infected with coronavirus. It's not known if this is going to make a difference in how the pandemic is being spread, to be honest with you. The hope is that it will, but we don't know that yet. Does that answer your question? Well, you mean um, yeah, that, that's really helpful. I, I appreciate that. And I, I guess we had a little bit of a follow-up question. Um, yes, I was wondering if you'll be changing any of your behaviors outside of just mask wearing, but um, I, I don't know, things like wiping stuff down. Will you be going to outdoor restaurants, for example, after you've been vaccinated? I've just been wondering what are these kinds of activities? A dentist. big one, yeah. I'm about to, my teeth are like, bad right now and i'd really like to go to the dentist yeah so that, that's um, where the that's where the vaccine will help i mean you can do those things with less concern that this virus is going to kill you if you get infected okay but but in terms of avoiding spread in the community you know the only thing that's going to nip this in the bud is universal masking and avoiding situations where the virus is spread okay Oh yeah, I'm never going out without a mask. That's yeah, not a question. But, but you know, the <laughs> vaccine, <laughs> at this point, I can't say, and nobody else can say, that the vaccine is really going to make that big of a difference in slowing down the spread of the virus in the country. Um, you know, the big advantage is just you're not going to have many, you're not going to have nearly as many people dying once they've been vaccinated. Not nearly so as many trying people to having to go in the hospital because they've been vaccinated. So there's some kind, there's some things that are more low risk where we can, because we can wear a mask all the time, but there's some things that are higher risk where, you know, once we're vaccinated, we're trying to figure out the mental calculus of whether or not can, you know, can we go, we, we've not, you know, we've not eaten outdoors. We've not done anything outside of the house without a mask on. Nothing. So now we're thinking, okay, once we all get vaccinated in our little pod, then can we finally go to an outdoor restaurant? You know, can we yeah, finally, I, you know, take out? I think you can go, you know, if there's social distancing, if there's social distancing at an outdoor restaurant, I think you can do that now, whether you're vaccinated or not. I do that. But I've looked at the I've looked at the outdoor restaurants, and people really they're not. Uh, it's not like you said, you know, people are not consistent, and, yeah. and you know the they're, they're sitting within six feet, but then you've got a waiter who's taking off his his uh, you know his mask so he can talk to you or something, and so it's just right. yeah that that's we're that's, thinking, that's that's when your judgment has to come into play. Yeah. But I think what, what, once you're you vaccinated, I think once you're vaccinated, it just will give you, it's really in terms of how it relates to activities that you do, you do run the risk equation and you just know that you're gonna be at less risk for getting severely sick if you happen to get infected in that venue. So that's where you okay. can use that information. Well, we were also trying to figure out we're also, we're wondering like, for example, like getting a haircut, we haven't had a haircut in, in like what, nine months, yeah. 12 months, I guess yeah. it's almost a year. Okay, um, so. again, I mean, um, I waited six months before I was brave enough to go get my haircut. It was just looking too bad. I just finally gave in, but the, um, <laughs> the salons that are responsible don't allow more than it depends on the size of the salon. The one I go to is, uh, you know, 
one of the clips franchises. I can't remember which one it is. They don't allow more than two people in there one time. You have to wear a mask and the uh, salon workers stay masked. So I think that's safe. Okay. It's just, you know, there's some business establish establishments that are responsible and some that are not. When I was down uh, on the Florida Gulf Coast um, in December, early December, um, there were some restaurants I would go to where they only had outdoor seating and it was at least six to 10 feet apart. You could only go in and order two people at a time and you had to have a mask on the whole time you were indoors and you could only eat in their outdoor tables. I went to other restaurants in the same town where it was wide open. I said, oh my God, we're in the middle of a pandemic and these people are being this irresponsible. So, um, so unless you know the state has strict regulations, which they did not in Florida at the time, obviously, um, there are some venues that are businesses that are going to be responsible, and there's some that are not, and you just have to choose wisely. Okay. Anything? Is anyone else in a city that has um, a little bit stricter regulations than than Birmingham? Those of us who are in Nashville, we have a mask mandate and uh, now there are fines associated with it and a little bit more kind of buttoned down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here in Kentucky, the rules are real stringent. They just started to uh, ease up a little bit recently. Yeah, I mean, the culture in different cities is very different. I was down in Miami uh, in December. Um, if you are walking on the street without a mask, you are persona non grata and people will let you know about it. So, you know, a lot of cities, people don't wear masks out on the street, like in Birmingham, you can walk out on the street without a mask. But uh, in the city of Miami, if you're not wearing a mask out on the street, you, you will be, <laughs> you can tell people are, are upset with you. And the police will, will, they have an ordinance that they can't legally enforce, but they will approach you and ask you to put on a mask. Just oh, we were, we were wondering um, specifically. We had one. You know, we, we're all we're all about to be completely vaccinated, and we've got one that once the second dose of vaccine and the two weeks have gone by and everything is you know pretty well protected, we're wondering if that one person is able to uh, finally um, hug and kiss the person outside of our pod that they've been dating for like months but have never touched or 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 had with had any close distance without a mask on. So we're just wondering how much risk that really adds to our little pod if that one person is, you know, is having- Well, it's, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna bring risk to your pod in terms of you getting sick, severely sick. If you're all vaccinated, you're not likely gonna get okay. sick, seriously ill from the virus. So that's, that's what the vaccine is doing for you. It will that's not really stand in the way of young love. No. <laughs> right. Well, it, it has. So I don't far. trust my teenage girls. <laughs> I don't trust them at all. Does right. that would that just be like unmasked behaviors or masked behaviors and everything? Like kissing. We're just wondering if they can actually kiss. I'm not. I'm not asking permission. I'm wondering if we can. <laughs> well, give I mean, it's, it's not the kissing. Yeah. It's it's so. It's just you know. It's the the sharing air kind. Of, it's the sharing of close air that's where the transmission occurs. So if you're kissing, you are very closely sharing a lot of air. <laughs> right. A lot of air is moving in and out quite briskly. Yeah. Okay, I think I, I think I finally get it. So we might all get the, we might get COVID from that interaction in the house, but none of us are very likely to get sick from that. Exactly, exactly. Okay. You know, I well, hope, sure. I mean, we're all hoping that, uh, we find out that immunized people are less likely to transmit the virus, but um, we just don't know that yet. I mean, you probably are. I mean, if, but you would think that would make sense, but the problem is most of this transmission occurs before you even have a symptom, okay? Right. Most of the people I take care of in the hospital probably aren't that infectious anymore because they're seven to 10 days into their illness when they're getting all the hyperinflammation that's brought them into the hospital 
and they're just two to three days from being convalesced. So, um, but when the problem is most of the transmission occurs before you have symptoms, um, we just don't know if the vaccine makes a difference there or not. That's gonna be very hard to determine that, to be honest with you. You're just gonna have to look at you know, infection rates compared to vaccination rates and see if they start correlating. Hey. The BMS tick 2 inhibitor, that would be considered an immune suppressant. It's kind of like um, Zildjian's class. So it, that, that's an immune suppressant. So that would, uh, the considerations would apply there. Um, wearing a mask at work, but not inside our offices, no one around. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're gonna be in your office by yourself and there's nobody, no, not anybody gonna be coming in there for the next hour, uh, you don't need to wear your mask. But if people are coming in to talk to you, um, if it's that venue, I would certainly put the mask on when the person comes in. If it's a real tiny office, um, it's probably best not to let people come in there if you haven't been wearing your mask because you could have virus circulating in that small area. So a lot of this depends upon how well ventilated the office is, how big it is. Those are the sorts of things you, you get concerned about. But when I'm in my office here, obviously, UAB, I don't really have people come in here. Somebody knocks on the door, I open the door and we talk at a distance. And I don't wear my mask in the office. The one haven I have where I don't have to wear a mask the whole time. I usually try to make them stay outside my door. <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's, that's what I would do. That, that makes the most sense. Person who's allergic to Celebrex and had an allergic reaction, they were unable to determine the cause. Uh, not sure what the question is there. Uh, I mean, if you have allergies to certain drugs, it doesn't increase the likelihood that you're going to have an allergy to the vaccine necessarily. Um, so I would say drug allergies shouldn't necessarily be a, a concern about um, getting the immunization. I mean, lupus patients tend to have more allergies to sulfa type drugs like Celebrex is. So um, that may be unique to that class of drug and probably shouldn't be an issue with uh, the vaccine if that's what the question was about. Uh, cyclosporin, yeah, I think that's an immunosuppressive. Um, I don't think that would necessarily impede a vaccine response. Um, I mean, the reason people take cyclosporin is certainly if you're taking it for an organ transplant, I would not stop the vaccine. I mean, I would not stop the cyclosporin or the tacrolimus around the time you get the vaccine. Um, if you're taking it for suppressing lupus flares, uh, you could probably get by without taking it for a week or two, but that's something you have to talk with the prescribing physician to just sort of work on that risk equation what impact that class of drug has on vaccine responses isn't really well known. Uh, recently got the COVID vaccine. How much time should you wait to get the flu vaccine? Um, I would say just wait a couple of weeks after your second dose and then get the flu shot. Um, you know, you just don't want to give two vaccines at the same time, just because of the chances if you get a reaction, you're not sure what you're dealing with. So if you're doing fine after your second dose of vaccine, or if you're doing fine after your first dose of vaccine after a week, I would say go ahead and get your flu shot. Don't wait any longer. Uh, you don't have to wait for the second one. Just, just wait at least a week between immunizations is, is a good rule to follow there. Outdoor activities without a crowd are, are safe. Yeah, that, I think that's fine. I go hiking in Red Mountain Park. That's five minutes from my where I live. Um, that's an outdoor venue where there's other people hiking as well. And just, you know, people keep their distance easy to do outdoors. I think that's safe and you don't really need, it's not necessary that you wear a mask in that, in that kind of environment. Allergies to drugs in the environment. We talked about drugs, environmental allergies. I don't think that increases your risk for getting an allergic reaction to a vaccine either. So if you get hay fever or if you've got asthma, the likelihood of you getting a reaction to the vaccine is, is low. You're vaccinated. Can you hug your grandson at seven? Uh, if you're fully vaccinated, I think you can hug your grandson because you're probably not going to get sick if he's infected. So yeah, I think that's one uh, potential advantage for older people once they've been fully vaccinated that 
you know, they can sort of lessen the tightness of the bubble they're in. Um, 11 people got sick, how sick from the vaccine? Um, you know, I mean, 11 people got sick from the virus. So uh, I don't know what the intensity of the illness was. I mean, it was intensive enough where, you know, they, they had symptoms of COVID. So, I mean, whether or not they were ICU sick or if they had common cold symptoms, um, I don't know how that parses out among those 11 that got sick, um, but sick just means that they had symptoms of the infection, mild or severe. Okay. Will one high risk person in a household make it to where all adults in a household can receive a vaccine? Um, no, that's not. And for the reason I said, I mean, the vaccine is intended to keep you from getting sick if you get infected. So um, if that's the major premise behind getting the vaccine, then that rationale wouldn't apply to that. Okay, well, that's all I know. It's all, not all based in science. A lot of it's opinion or scientifically informed opinion. Uh, we'll have a lot more answers um, forthcoming in the coming months. So uh, maybe we can just, as I told Tracy, we can do a monthly update on all this. So awesome. you know, I know a hell of a lot more than